I tried getting in better shape than I'd ever been in. I tried changing jobs. I tried moving to a different city. I tried getting into relationships. I tried getting out of relationships. I suffered a lot with anxiety, anger, and bitterness, and it consumed my whole life. I tried literally everything that you could imagine to quit drinking on my own, and I couldn't. You know, I've always dealt with an issue with food and eating, being overweight my whole life, and it's affected my life every day. Just angry at the world and not happy with myself or with anybody else. I, I was just this person that was just walking through life aimlessly. I felt like death was knocking on my back door. The way I was treating myself and the way I was treating my body just wasn't hurting me. Um, it was hurting all the people that were around me. I was trapped in anger, bitterness, anxiety ridden all the time. Never had any peace. We leave a trail of damage, not just to ourselves, but the people that love us the most are the ones that we hurt the most. When a good friend of mine passed away at the age of 52, it really affected me and uh, made me think about where my life was headed. I learned to forgive myself, to forgive other people, and to try to treat the things people do and the things I do in a Christ-like manner. And that has made all the difference in my life. It has set me free from all that bondage and garbage and baggage that held me down. It has changed the way I look at life. It has made me face my fears. A wave of peace come over me and I felt at ease and I gave it all to God. It's taught me how to work through it, how to look at it and how to give it to God and let him have control of it. And it doesn't hold me hostage anymore. And it wasn't until I found God in Jesus Christ that I was able to find any length of continuous sobriety in my life. Praise the Lord. Again, welcome everybody to Open Arms Community Church and to our Easter series called Recovery. And when you think about recovery, some of us may be saying, I'm not really sure this applies to me, right? Because when I say the word recovery, what is it that typically comes to mind? drugs and alcohol. Most of us think that recovery is for those that have some form of substance addiction. It is a program that they need to get involved with and through maybe 12 st steps or a physician's assistance, they can find victory over their addiction. However, friends, when you look at the definition of recovery, we're going to see that it's actually a whole lot more than that. So in your outlines, I want you to notice that recovery means restoration or return to any former, normal, or better state. Hmm. I think that could apply to most of us. How about you? I think we all have areas of our life that were once normal but are now not normal. I think we all have areas of our life that were once in a better state than they are today. And wouldn't it be awesome to have them return to that former normal or even better state? It goes on. It is the action or process of regaining possession or control of something stolen or lost. And you know Many of us have been through life experiences where something has been stolen or lost, something that needs to be regained. We've all had areas of our life where we were once in control, but we're no longer in control. And it can be quite messy. It can be quite ugly. So based on this definition, friends, we believe at Open Arms Community Church that recovery is not just for those that struggle with an addiction to some drug or to alcohol, but we believe that recovery is for every human being on the face of the planet, and it is, in fact, the very purpose for which Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, came to earth and which we celebrate in this Easter season. So with this in mind... Believing that recovery is for everyone. Here is my challenge for every single one of us in this room today. 
I want to challenge you to make it a point to come to every one of these lessons together. Make sure that over the next four Sundays, four Sundays, because what we're going to be doing is giving you a road map. We're going to talk through what does this look like so that you can make an informed decision on where am I going to go from here. So make that commitment for Sundays. And what I'd like you to do right at this moment is take a look at the screen at this picture because this picture really symbolizes where a lot of us are at. So we've got this really cool sports car, which is a metaphor for our life. And the story is, is that like many people have experienced across the United States and even in other parts of the country, world, uh, you know, somebody has this nice hot sports car sitting in their driveway and then they look out the window and it's gone because it was stolen. And the people that took it drove it recklessly and they got wild and they got crazy and went on a chase and guess what? They smashed into things. And it wreaked damage and brokenness inside and out. The owner did not make this choice, didn't do anything wrong. It was other people's choices and other people's behaviors that were imposed upon them that brought this hurt, this damage into their world. That happens, doesn't it? It happens that people say things and they do things. No choice of our own. And through circumstance or other people's choices, we end up being a victim. Maybe we've gone through a divorce. Our own or maybe the divorce of a loved one that was very painful for us. Maybe we have gone through a death of a loved one. Maybe, friends, we have been involved in an accident or we've been bullied. And these are all things that happen in life that we have no control over. We don't choose them. They just happen. Somebody else chooses to steal what belongs to us and to treat it poorly and carelessly and recklessly. And what happens is damage. Now, if that was all there was, we could all sit around, hold hands, cry together, and have pity parties. However, that's not the only side to this story. Because another side of this story, and some of us have been here as well, is we get this new sports car, and we want to test it out. We want to see what this puppy can do, and we feel like we can do it. We can control it. We're in charge, and so we're going to drive fast, and we're going to drive hard, and we get reckless, and we get careless, and the next thing you know, we're smashing into things, right? And it produces damage, brokenness and pain, and the sad reality is that whether it's by the choices of other people and the behaviors of other people inflicted upon us or whether it's our choices and behaviors inflicted upon other people, the reality is is that the brokenness and the pain, the damage inside and out never just stays with us. It always has a ripple effect. We hurt the people we've run into. Right? So recovery is what happened in the life of this vehicle. Although for many of us, when we look at this picture, that's not what we see. For many, when we look at this, we see the damaged car as a symbol or a metaphor of our today, our present, and we look at that vehicle on the other side in pristine condition as a metaphor or a symbol of our past the glory days when everything was awesome. But the truth is, friends, the reason you and I are here is because the message of Jesus, the work of Jesus Christ, flips this around 
and says that that damage, that broken, busted up life that you see over here, friends, that is, it may very well be your present. But the other vehicle is not who you were in the past. It's who you're going to be as you walk with Jesus, a restored person, a person that gets put back together, a person that is brought back into control, a person that finds stability and wholeness and freedom and victory and becomes all that you were originally meant to be. Friends, that's the hope. That's the good news of what Jesus came to do. And as I said earlier, we are going to, over the next several weeks, talk about a roadmap, a blueprint, if you will, of recovery. What does it look like and how can we go from this busted up wreckage of a life to something that's whole again, something that's, that's more than just drivable, but enjoyable to drive again? How can life become all it was originally meant to be? Because the truth is, it can. And with that in mind, again, I want to just challenge you, make the commitment over the next four weeks to come every Sunday. Don't miss one. And in order to start this journey, there is one thing that we have to be crystal clear on just one more time, and that is that for every one of us in this room, Recovery is not just for those who are addicted to some drug or to alcohol. It's for all of us because we've all had something lost or stolen from us. We've all had something that was damaged and wrecked and broken and hijacked. We've all had something that has gone from better to worse that went from controlled to messy. And it's time for us to start becoming who God meant for us to be. It's time, time to start taking back what was hijacked. Amen? So in your outlines, here's what we need to understand. Everyone has issues, and we all need recovery. Some of those issues are big, some are small, some are manageable, and some are completely a mess. Some of them are socially accepted. Some of them are condemned. But whether hard or easy, big or small, whatever our issues are, the reality is, is we all have them. And in fact, 1 John chapter 1 says that all wrongdoing is sin. So I need to clarify that. Has anybody ever done anything wrong? Okay, so when you and I did something wrong, the Bible word for that is sin. And I need you to understand that because of the rest of our time together. So all wrongdoing is sin. And what is sin? Because when I say the word sin, the first thing that comes to most people's mind is some heinous act. Like rape or murder or something else like that. When in fact, sin by definition in your outline, sin is simply missing the bullseye. That's literally what it means, missing the bullseye or less than God's best or less than perfect. Can we all admit that we're not perfect today? We've all done it wrong and that means we've all sinned. So has anybody ever played darts before? Yeah, so here's the picture that you need to get. This is how it works. And it isn't always that you do something wrong intentionally. In fact, there are many times you can have every intention of doing it right and still miss. So when you started playing darts, I don't know about you, but this was my experience, is I walk up, I step up to the line, I've got my darts in hand, and I aim. I'm aiming. I have every intention of hitting the bullseye. And that dart goes everywhere but the bullseye. Are you tracking with me? So sometimes, sometimes we do it wrong intentionally. Mama says, stay out of that cookie jar, and we get into it, right? So there is, there are there those moments where 
we intentionally and on purpose choose to do it wrong, and that is sin. However, sin isn't isolated to intentional, purposeful disobedience. Sin also counts, and I know that's hard for us to accept, but sin also counts even when we have every intention of doing it right, but we still don't hit the bullseye. And for anybody to ever say, well, I don't sin, I'm not a sinner, is to say that every time they got up to that line, from day one, all the days of their life, is there anybody who has thrown a bullseye every time, from start to finish, every day of their life? The answer, no, no. And here's the thing. We've all missed it. In fact, again, in Romans chapter 3, God says, for everyone has sinned. Circle the word everyone. Has sinned. We have all missed the bullseye. We have all done wrong. And it may have been on purpose or it may have been completely by accident, unintentional. But it still happens. And when we make those wrong decisions, friends, as we're about to see, bad things happen. And when we make those wrong accidents Friends, as we're about to see, bad things happen. Everyone has sinned. We all, circle the word all, fall short of God's glorious standard. How many know God is perfect? But we are not. We were meant to be. We're meant to be like him, but we're not. And so we live in this tension. And we find ourselves wanting even to do the right thing but falling short, which we'll talk more about that in the weeks to come. So here's the deal. Since we have now established that we have all sinned, we've all done it wrong, what's the big deal? That just seems normal, right? That seems human. But in fact, it's not. You and I weren't created for sin. That's why it harms us. We were created to be like God. And so there is a consequence when we do it wrong. Again, whether on purpose wrong or by accident wrong, there is an effect that happens in our life. We all become slaves. And I know that we would say, well, we would deny it, right? Well, I'm no slave to anything. I'm a free man. I'm an American, right? We're not slaves in America. And we find ourselves in the very same place that a group of people found themselves in as they stood and were talking to Jesus one day. These people were known as the Pharisees. They were the religious elite. They were a people that took following God very seriously, and they took their behavioral choices very seriously, and they were all about doing it right. And so Jesus comes to them one day in John chapter 8, and, uh, and he confronts them and says, Listen, guys, if you hold to my teachings and don't stray, if you hold fast to my teachings and you put them into practice, then you are truly my disciples. And then, he said, and we as Christians love to quote this part, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Isn't that awesome? However, their response, they heard that statement. And, of course, we as Christians, we grab onto that last little phrase and try to ignore the part about actually following Jesus his way. And we just focus on the know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Yeah. But these Pharisees did not like what Jesus had to say. And so they reject what he said. They retort back to him saying, uh, excuse me, we're Abraham's children. We're the descendants of Honest Abe, the original, and we're here to tell you that we've never been anybody's slaves. We're not slaves. What are you talking about being free? And this is not in your outline, but it'll be on the screen in John chapter 8, in verse 34. Note that Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, everyone 
Whose sins, stop there a second, how many is that? It's everybody, right? So everyone who sins is what? A slave to sin. Have you ever found yourself wanting to do the right thing, but you do the wrong thing anyway? We're going to talk about that. I want you to see another translation of this verse because it's pretty powerful. In the voice translation, it says, I tell you the truth. Everyone who commits sin surrenders his freedom to sin. He is a slave to sin's power. So according to God, wrongdoing is sin. And according to God and experience, everyone has sinned. Agreed? And according to Jesus, God in the flesh... Anyone who sins becomes a slave to sin. And so we need freedom. How do we get that freedom? Jesus talked about it. And friends, the first step is not to live in denial that we don't have a problem, that everybody sins, so it's okay, it's human, that it's no big deal. We didn't mean to hurt anybody. We didn't mean for things to go this way. So it's okay, right? No. No. So the first step is to stop denying and start admitting. Start admitting that we have problems, that we have issues. And some of those are issues that are a part of our life because of choices we've made Things that we have intentionally and purposefully done, even though they weren't the best, they weren't perfect, therefore they were sin. And some of us are living with brokenness in our life because of choices and behaviors of other people. And now we're in a position where that they inflicted damage on us and we perpetuate that damage because of how we respond to it how we react to it and deal with it. And we don't even realize that where we were legitimately a victim, now we've become the perpetrator of our own prison. Some of us, we all have problems. Some of us, they're internal things like lust or pride, our ego, right? Some are external things like drugs or alcohol, sex, food. Maybe gossip, how we speak, our language, right? For others, again, internal things like anger or that driving force of greed. Maybe offense, we're bitter. Some of us are overly critical, we're pessimistic and overly negative. Others, we struggle with gambling, this outward damage that it brings, Others, we battle depression or anxiety, extreme fear, doubt. Others, we're battling weight issues, food problems, as we mentioned. Some, we're battling materialism. Maybe it's entertainment that has become our problem or some other habit that destroys. That was a pretty long list. I'm sure some of us found ourselves there. Here's the question that you have to figure out. Number one, what have I been living in denial with? What are the issues that I've been trying to ignore or brush over or bury? What are my issues? Because we've all got them. We've just seen. We've all got them. Now, the question is, what are my issues? And the second is, what am I going to do about it? I can continue to sit and spend the rest of my life in prison to it. I can do that. I can continue to be that damaged vehicle all the days of my life to my last breath, if I so choose. Or knowing that I can't fix it all, knowing that I'm not the end-all answer to all my problems, though I have a part to play, I can 
decide. I can make that first step in this journey, and I can stop denying, stop ignoring, stop burying, and I can start admitting. I can start admitting. I've got this problem. And we're going to talk about what to do with it. Now that we are admitting it, now that we, we're holding it and it's in our hands and we're seeing it and we're calling it what it is, now what? We're going to talk about that. That's why you need to come back next week. Okay? But here's what I want you to see. God warns us. Not only is our first step admitting, but he warns us of the consequences if we don't. So very quickly, Proverbs 28 says, whoever conceals their sins. So we try to hide it. We try to bury it. Pretend it's not there. We paint it up to look real good for everybody, right? Whoever conceals their sins does not prosper. We always think it'll be better if we just don't hurt them. Right? It's better to just make it look good and pretty, hide it if we have to, because knowing would be too hard for them. It would make me look horrible. It would cost me big. It'll cost them big. No, 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 no. No, but notice, concealing, we don't prosper. But the one who confesses and renounces them finds what? What we've been looking for, mercy. Mercy. Isn't it funny that the very thing that we want, we become our own worst enemy and undo. We think that by hiding it, everything will be fine. No. That by ignoring it, painting it up to look pretty, everything will be great. No. The real freedom, the mercy that you and I are longing for, can't come until we confess. Don't conceal it. Confess it. And renounce it. Which means I say here's the wrong thing, and I'm saying it's wrong. I'm not going to justify it. I'm not going to say it's right because it's wrong. I'm not going to make light of it and say, well, it could have been worse. It wasn't at that bad. No, it's wrong. And it's hurtful. And I'm not going to do it anymore. We'll talk more about that later. So in your outlines, how we choose to respond, be it to deny, conceal, or admit it, confess, determines the outcome. So you have to decide, what kind of outcome do I want to, to live in? Do I want to spend the rest of my life in prison, lying to the people around me and lying to myself, but staying nonetheless a prisoner to my problem? Or do I want to find freedom? Freedom, yes, freedom from that addiction, but freedom from that bitterness and anger, Freedom from that bad habit of looking at things I shouldn't look at. Freedom from that habit that's destroying my body, whether it's overeating or the use of tobacco, right? I mean, there's a million and one things that, that we could be engaged in that can be ruining our life and hurting other people. And the bottom line is, friends, how we choose to respond will determine the outcome. In Proverbs chapter 5, God warns us again. He says, for your ways are in full view of the Lord, and he examines all your paths. You might fool some people. You may even get away with fooling most people. But we never fool God. He always sees us just as we are. He is truth. And that's how he sees everything, according to truth. The evil deeds of the wicked ensnare them. So our wrongdoing becomes a trap. The cords of their sins hold them fast. So when we do wrong, 
we become trapped in it, and we literally get chained up. The cords of our sin hold them fast. And for lack of discipline, note this, they will die. Led astray by their own great folly. We'll be tempted to want to blame everybody else. We'll be tempted to want to blame the devil, maybe even God. That person that said that mean thing to us. We're going to be tempted to blame a whole lot of other people, but in truth, it's our choices and how we respond to things. And note the destruction. When we live in sin, here's why God, are you ready? Here's why God hates sin. Because it destroys And friends, it destroys everything God loves. You and all the people around you. And he's not okay with that. And that's good news for you and me because he came into our world. And we're going to celebrate it this week and next Sunday, Easter. And he did something incredible for each one of us so that we don't have to stay slaves to sin. Remember Jesus said? You can be free. We can enter into a whole new life. But to wrap things up, I do want to very quickly help you get a a clear picture of what we're getting into. So when we talked about recovery, remember that it is a regaining, right? A restoring, a returning to the former state or even to something better, right? It is a process of regaining control or possession of what was lost or stolen. And so with that in mind, there are a couple things, a few things that you and I need to be very understanding of as we start this process, because that's what it is of recovery. So in your outlines, very quickly, recovery is a process that takes five things. Number one, commitment. It's not just starting the journey. We have to stick with the journey, and we have to finish the journey. I have known many people that stepped into sobriety, and they walked in that sobriety for a season. For some, it was weeks, others, months. I've seen people be sober for decades And then, for whatever reason, they step back into their problem of the past. And they end their journey in prison, again, to their problem. And we don't want that. We want to start this journey, we want to stick with this journey, and we want to complete the journey. Amen? We don't want to just enter into freedom and wholeness and life to the full for a season. We want it to become our life. Yes? So, first thing in this process of recovery that it takes is commitment. The second thing is time. It takes time. There is no quick fix to all of our problems and issues. And the reality is is we have to also take into perspective that for many of us, our problems didn't just come about in a moment, I mean, someone might have said something or did something, but it's been years in development, years in the making. We've got 10, 20, some of us 30 years under our belt with this problem. Understand, it's going to take time. We can be free from it in a moment by the power of Jesus, but we will have a life of cleaning up and rebuilding, right? Right? And we'll talk more on that next week. The third thing it takes is resources. There are things that you and I don't know, but we need to know. And so we're going to need resources. We're going to need help. And that leads to number four, then, is that we're going to need to work at it. It's going to take work. 
while we are not the sole answer to our problem, we do have a part to play. And there are things we're going to need to start doing, and there are things we're going to need to stop doing. And lastly, as I mentioned, number five is help. We're going to need help. We can't do this by ourselves. First and foremost, we're going to need God's help. But secondly, we will need other people to share this journey with us. We cannot do it alone. And if we do it alone, we are easy prey. The Bible warns us to not go through life alone. We are stronger and smarter together. And when we are by ourselves, the Bible describes us like this. For your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And here's the interesting thing about lions. They don't attack a whole herd and try to take them all out. They maneuver themselves in such a way so as to cause one to become separated from the herd. Or they prowl and they sneak and they wait until one, through distraction, through desire, through disorientation, they find themselves by themselves. And that's when the lion strikes. We will all need help. So with those five things in mind of what it's going to take for us to walk in this process, where do we start? It all starts with confession. Confession. Admitting we have the issue. Identifying it and calling it what it is. In 1 John 1, 9, here it is. If we confess our sins, and that's talking to the Lord, confessing them to the Lord. He, God, is faithful and just and will forgive. He will forgive. Some of us need to hear that today. He will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. That mercy and that forgiveness that we're looking for is there. How do we enter into it? By just admitting. Confess it to God. Lord, I'm wrong. I've screwed up. Or, Lord, I was wronged, and I've responded to that wrong by becoming bitter and angry, and now I'm hurting myself and others. So confess it to the Lord. But that's not all. We need to find a circle of people that we can trust, confidants, people that will love us and pray for us and hold us accountable. And we need to share with them as well our issue. James chapter 5 says, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Is it so that I can get forgiveness? No. No, the forgiveness comes from God, and I might need to confess to those that I've wronged and ask forgiveness. But... The confession that is talking about here to your fellow man is a confession of confiding for prayer and support and encouragement and accountability. Now, you may find that you have this circle naturally in your life, or you may find that you don't and you're looking for it. So first of all, I would like to invite you after this Easter week, so on next Wednesday, not this one coming, the following. Starting at 6.30, our Celebrate Recovery will be meeting, and we invite you to that. Come out and be a part of it. And again, it's not just for those battling substance abuse. It's for anybody seeking freedom, healing, and wholeness, and victory over all hurts, hang-ups, and habits. So we invite you out to that. But secondly... I wonder what we need to confess today. I'd like us to just take a moment as we close our time together, and I would like you to close your eyes, and I want you to think. And I just want to take a moment to pray. Lord God, you know our hearts, our minds, our lives. You know us inside and out. You know us better than we know ourselves. And right now, I pray, Spirit of God, search us and know us. Bring to our understanding those things, anything 
that is imprisoning us, anything that is enslaving us, anything that has become a trap and that is keeping us from the mercy that we long for, the wholeness, the freedom, and the victory, the life that we were created for. Lord God, what is it? And as your spirit searches our hearts and our minds and our lives and brings these things to our understanding, I pray, God, that you will help us to bring those things to you. For some of us, it's right now. It's in this moment. And we just need to take this moment to confess, God, I have said this. I have done that. I have had this thought and it has hurt me, it has hurt others, it is wrong. Please forgive me. For some of us, it'll be days from now. But we need to keep praying and keep asking, God, search us. Reveal to us anything that's holding us back. And right now, I just want to lead you in a simple prayer to confess. A simple prayer of doing more than confessing our wrong, but confessing Jesus as our answer. If it's in your heart today to take this first step of acknowledging that you have an issue that needs dealt with, and you want to give that issue to Jesus today, I want to invite you to say this prayer with our church family together. Say, in the name of Jesus, I come to you, God, thanking you for loving me and for pursuing me and for doing for me what I could not do for myself. Today, I confess my wrongs. You know them all, big and small, and I confess them. I call them wrong. And I renounce them. I don't want to do that anymore. Instead, I want to do life your way and get your results. Set me free. Forgive me. And help me to be all you made me to be. And to faithfully follow you all the days of my life to my last breath. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you pray.